If y'all would take a look, look at your list that you created, you know, your own list, you don't share it with anybody else, but take a look at your list of what you thought the causes of poverty were um, when we started this. And is there, does somebody want to share about a direction they leaned? Were you more leaning toward individual behaviors or were you more leaning toward political and economic? What, what, where, where kind of were you leaning? Mine was more social and community based. Okay. Um, I know we learned in the reading group that we're doing with this workshop that 80% of uh, in money and income and status is inherited. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just kind of looked at it where the average person who does not have that legacy or the background yeah. and that, that helping, you know, that start in life, you know, you got to take out student loans, you got to pay those back. So. Right. Getting out of that vicious cycle, I lean more toward that as okay. opposed to it's your, you know, your individual choice in life is that okay. that's what puts you there. Okay. Because sometimes if you don't have those resources, that background, okay. you don't know how to make wise choices. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm definitely thinking of it very systematically, um, and in the sense of like a system of um, like you're born into an environment that doesn't encourage you to be creative, to be motivated to create something, then where, where is that going to translate later in life? Okay. And there's so many things like that, yeah. um, especially institutionalizing culturally and still mentalities too. Okay, okay. Anybody else? I, I think it's the environment. Like I said, they, they grow up in, okay. I, I was a big sister for a little sister, and her mother would not go to school. If, her, if, if she forgot something, her mother would would go knock on the door, hand it to her, and the teacher told me that he, he would invite her in and she would never go in. Uh, I was the one who went to open house, and I was the one who went to talk to her yeah. teachers. Um, and she didn't do her homework, and when I asked her why she wasn't doing her homework, well, and I asked her mother, you know, about doing her homework, and she said, well, I want her with me all the time when I'm ho when she's home because it's not, it's not safe in this neighborhood. And so she kept her with her and of course, what they did was watch TV in the dark. You can't do your homework in, TV in, in the dark. And later when she moved, after I moved out of town, and, and, and I, she told me that they had moved, and I said, what do you like best about your new house? And she said, I don't hear guns anymore. And so her mother was certainly right to be concerned yeah. about the safety. Sure, but sure. So environment is a big part of it, the community that we grow up Well, and the whole together. attitude, yeah, and, and yeah. The, the, uh, the, the feelings about education. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when she said she wanted to go to college, her mother said, well, I didn't go to college, I'm doing okay. Mm -hmm. you know, she dropped out of high school, now she's on welfare, yeah. you know. But that was okay with her, she's doing okay. Um, so I don't know. It, it, it's so hard to overcome that, I think. It's sure, sure. So do you kind of see how, you know, you kind of have your idea of what causes poverty, but did you notice that there are other there are other factors that play into it and how we absolutely have to look at all of it? Um, can you all take a guess at what the graduating, getting ahead grads lean toward? What they think is the thing, the, one of those four topics that <coughs> causes poverty, the one they think the most? Do they say individual? It's individual. They're so hard on themselves. They are so hard on themselves. It's all, they look at all individual behaviors. A lot of people would think that they, um, you know, it would be political and economic or they blame it on. You know, that it absolutely is not. They're absolutely so hard on themselves and they're hard on the people around them. Have you noticed that too in your class? Yes. Whoa, they're hard on each other. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's societal mm -hmm. and, and maybe even perhaps. you just don't realize there was a little uh, on uh, one of our pastors that um, we work with at Compassion Coalition had put a thing on Facebook that said how privileged are you 
and it asks you all these questions, and it, it it just it was shocking to hear all those questions. You just don't realize it, and that's just like mm -hmm. the subject of exploitation. the The dominant group is more likely to kind of be in denial that it happens. Um, I know one of the things that I used to be in complete denial about um, when I first started working at Child and Family, I was doing home home visits, and I was in the community a whole lot. Um, I never thought a police officer would say anything ugly or do anything. Y'all, I was so, I mean, it's laughable how naive I was when I first got into the field, but I just could not imagine it because I'd never experienced it, I guess. And I was walking with one of my clients uh, back to her house, and the police chased this um, guy through, It's it was in Austin Homes, and it's really, I don't know if y'all are familiar with it, but it's, there's there, before they tore most of it down, but... Uh, but there were a lot of really skinny places and where you had to go in or whatever. And I was with one of my clients there, and the police chased him, and they said some really horrible things that I was really shocked about and called names that I didn't. I mean, I, I just wouldn't have. I don't know. It just, it's scary to think of how naive I was. But I just stood there. I didn't move. And my client's going, we got to get in the house. I mean, you know, guns drawn and everything. And I'm going, I just <laughs> stood there. And she was like, all right, you know, or whatever. But I just, I cried after that because I thought, I just couldn't believe some of the words and the names that they used. I just didn't believe it. And I'm not saying everybody does that. I'm just saying that's just one example in my own life of how I didn't understand it. So I didn't understand there was exploitation. And sometimes when you have some privileges that you don't even realize that you have, you know, you don't you don't recognize it. So that's why it's so important to open up your mind. And I want to touch just like on the education which she was saying um, earlier. We didn't grow up with a lot of money were in my family, but uh, and a lot of that had to do because, you know, there were seven of us and my father was a preacher and they believed in being fruitful and multiplying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Bible tells yeah. But um <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, my father worked but there just wasn't enough. So sometimes we lived in lower class neighborhoods, um, and a lot of those children didn't have a two parent home where I went. But my father was educated and my mother even though she didn't have a college education, she was self-taught educated. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, when I graduated from college and I started out in K through 12, mm -hmm. I didn't understand when I sent the child's homework home because they didn't, you know, you didn't finish this, parents wouldn't come in the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't want to address it. But a lot of that had to do with they didn't know how to help the child. Sure. So if your child wants, has great aspirations with education, mm -hmm. my father could help me with my homework. And they, they can. Exactly. And think about the mental model too. It's it's not only that they they sometimes they can't. That's part of it. But if you think about the mental model that Carolyn talked about, and they're constantly living in the tyranny of the moment. Transportation takes longer. Say you have four kids. One of them's getting in trouble at school all the time. This is happening in your neighborhood. You're worried about safety, like you talked about, and all that's going on. Where is homework fit in that? The model. Absolutely. Is is there a lot of chaos in the home? absolute chaos there may be you know a lot of family members living in the home there's just lots of it's it's, it's I used to call it when I did home home visits I used to be like it's chaos I mean it's complete chaos you know sometimes when I would do home visits but it's just um it's just a part of it and that's the way it is and that's where you know they don't and they don't necessarily have the time to help them with the homework or go advocate when there's a problem and we'll we'll talk a whole lot about language and how that plays into being able to advocate for your child as well and, and has to do with whether or not you can help your child with your homework or not. Um, and I'll be really honest with you, um, there's some homework I can't help my child with, <laughs> and I have a college degree. So, I mean, it just, it's... But, but we have yeah, resources no to get the child the help. Yeah. So they are just overwhelmed right. and forget about if it. If I can't Let's help, what do I do? I find somebody who can, or I get a tutor, or I do, you know, whatever. Because I have, I have the time, I'm not in the tyranny of the moment, I'm thinking about her future. Uh, where it's very difficult to think about the future at all when you're living in this tyranny of the moment all the time. When you had the resources. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, uh, this, that's the end of uh, causes of poverty. So we talked about our mental models, we talked about the causes of poverty and how we need to think about all of those causes. And I wanna go over just a few key points with you. You have a handout that Rusty gave you there and it has all of the key points for bridges and all of the bridges constructs. I'm not going to go over these in detail because we have a little less time with this class because we talk about a lot of these things throughout Bridges. But there are three of the key points that I don't feel like we bring out in detail that I just want to mention briefly. And, and then I'm going to have you all take a look at it here in a minute. But let's just talk about a few of them. 
One of those is that economic class is relative and it's regional. Huh? Oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't even notice that it was not. Um, so, um, shoot, that was the beginning. Okay, so economic class is relative. So if you were to take your current salary that you have right now, that you make right now, and you were to move to New York City, and you were to make that same salary, would you be in poverty, middle class, or wealth? Poverty. Most of us would be in poverty because the cost of living is so different there. So it is regional and it is relative. It's also relative to what you know. You will hear many of people say that, you know, we were poor growing up, but everybody was. And... You know, it just you know it was just a part of it, and we our our needs were met by this, that, or the other. Or they may say things like, you know, uh, I may be be poor, but I'm not ugly. You know, things like that. It's just relative in what you know and what you what what you feel. Also, people in wealth, you will hear them say, cite somebody who has more, or they'll be like, it's all on paper anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of relative to what you know. If you're in middle class and you lose a job or a spouse loses a job and you were doing just fine and now you're living on one income, you feel like you're in poverty, but you're absolutely not in poverty. If you go look at those poverty guidelines, you're not anywhere near it. So, but to you, you feel like it because that's what you're used to. So it's really relative to what you know and it's also regional. Jan, just one thing quickly that I learned in another workshop um, by these folks is that also, you know, the bulk of, if you, if you put all of people's people on a continuum and the wealthiest are at one end and the poorest are at the other end, you know, it's a small portion that are at the two extremes, but of those two extremes, a significant percentage of those groups self-identify as middle class, even though they're not, mm -hmm. which I think is fascinating and I think is especially pertinent in our work with students because students don't want to be known as being economically under-resourced. Mm -hmm. And there's a, I've even had one faculty member tell me that there's a difference in how that works at the different site campuses. Like at Hardin Valley campus, it's a lot, you really <coughs> want to, you know, keep it on the, is it down low or low down, I forget. <laughs> 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 but, you know, you, you don't want to be known as having economic need here, whereas at Blount County, it feels a little bit different, it's a little bit more acceptable. Mm -hmm. So, for what that's worth. Wow. Wow. Um, also, I just want to mention that generational poverty is very different than situational poverty. Um, when you've been in generational poverty, you've been in poverty for more than two generations. That's what con that considers you to be in generational poverty, and you really lack resources. When you're in situational poverty, you may have been in a situation where there was a death of a spouse, or there's an illness in the family and that person can no longer work. But there's a situation that has caused you to end up in a poverty situation. Now we're going to talk about all the resources, but when you have some resources, it may not be financial right now, but you have lots of other resources, whether it be your social capital that you have, whether it be um, your physical you know, resources, what, no matter what that resource is, you've got resources to build on and people in your life you can count on. Where a lot of times people in generational poverty, everybody in their family is in the exact same situation. And so we're going to talk about hidden rules next. But um, there's a different set of rules when you're in generational poverty and when you're in, when you're in when you're middle class. And sometimes when you don't have any of those hidden rules in middle class, you, you can't hold out a job because that's how we operate. We operate on middle class hidden rules in our businesses, <coughs> in our schools, and in our community. And when we don't know those hidden rules, it can be very difficult to survive or move ahead. Um, the other one I want to bring up is that in order to achieve, you may have to give up a relationship for a time and there's several different different reasons for this it may be that you've been in relationships with people who are, are use alcohol and drugs and you're in recovery so in order to get ahead and move on and to become self-sufficient you're gonna have to step back from those relationships it may also be that your family is holding you back a little bit and that's one of the hardest things um, have you ever heard anybody say he's getting above his raisins you know, or, or something like that. You hear that. You hear people say that. Sometimes for the family members, it can be really difficult when they see someone else in their family that's moving ahead and they feel like they're getting left behind. And so sometimes they don't even realize they're doing it, but they can really, I called it sabotage when I was doing it <laughs> in home services. I mean, I literally had a boyfriend um, who, who lived with my client. 
um, who was turning off my client's alarm. And I kept being like, you cannot be late for your GED classes. You have to be on time. You know, we've, we've got to work this out. And I couldn't understand it. She seemed so motivated and all of this stuff. And she finally discovered that her boyfriend was turning that alarm clock off because she was kind of moving on a little bit without him. You know, she was, you know, doing better or whatever. But it can also have, happen with your parents or with anybody else in your family. They feel really, you know, um, uncomfortable when you start to move in a different direction. Um, so you may have to give up relationships, and that can be very hard because what is the driving force for people in poverty? Relationships. All about relationships. So that can be very difficult for them. Yeah, I, I think even it puts them at risk. Maybe not physically, like safety, but I mean just in terms of if those are their support systems and then they're trying they lose to that, accomplish yeah. an achievement and something blocks that, I guess I think that happens a lot here. Absolutely. If they're first-generation college students and their parents are not supportive, then if something happens, sometimes that support is gone. Absolutely. Or compromised. Absolutely. Um, I kind of felt like the categories we discussed earlier in the previous module and this discussion um, kind of attaches to two things. One is autonomy and recognizing that we all have it. Mm -hmm. um, and then also recognizing that when we engage with other, others, it should be um, with the intention of bringing nourishment whatever that is. So those are the two things Absolutely. for self and then others. Because even if it's, um, we, we all recognize how um, exploiting others is lacking in the nourishment. But um, when we express our political ideologies, and you see online these vicious statements of welfare mooches not going to help them, that's public shaming. And uh, mm -hmm. it's still abusive, just like mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. So I feel like those are the two key factors that are yeah. playing into things. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great, great point. Um, so what I'd like you guys to do is just take a few minutes and at your, um, kind of at your tables, if you would, um, if you guys would kind of look over the key points and constructs, just read over them briefly, and then just talk amongst yourselves about if there's anything that stands out to you, if there's any one of those that really stands out to you that maybe you didn't think of before, um, but just, just talk about those at your, at your tables for just a minute, kind of read over them. anything that might stand out to you or Because she had lost her job. Or, and I'm saying the other, because I mean, I think 
So she had to go I mean, today I'm going to make sure that 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 I'm
<laughs> the answer to that is, why are they hidden? Why do you think hidden rules are sort of hidden? They call them hidden rules. Do we go around talking about the hidden rules? They're not articulated frequently, right? Is it, are, they, are they a result of those patterns that we spoke about? Earlier? Yes, yes, definitely. So when you were growing up, you know, did your mother ever give you the look? Did you ever get the look when you did something wrong? You know, all right, and you, you didn't have to say anything, right? Because you broke some rule that you know she had for you. Um, did you ever give anybody the look when they did something, and you're like, oh, I can't believe they did that. So yeah, I think we tend to do that. We can't help it. We're sort of you know sort of where we're coming from. So <clears throat> what I want you to do, I'm, I think we'll have a little activity, and um, I'm going to give you an example of a hidden rule, just because I want you to be thinking about times that you might have broken a hidden rule. Um, think of times that you may have given someone the look, or think of a group you're in that has specific hidden rules that only the people in that group know. So I'll give you an example of one just to get you thinking a little bit about groups. Um, I was working with Burundian refugees, and I went into their home, a lady that I've been working with quite a bit, and I was going over there for a meeting to help her with resources and what have you, and I walk into her small apartment, and in the living room, very small living room, all, all these men were sitting around there, and there was one spot open for me. The women were standing in the kitchen because the men did the important business and the women stood in the kitchen. And so, you know, I sat down and the, the lady came up and was very hospitable and what have you. And she came out with <coughs> a tray and on the tray she had a bowl of <coughs> water and there was no coffee table. And she set the bowl of water at my feet. And I'm like, oh, I, I wasn't quite sure what this cultural whatever was. And I was like, okay, I can either take my shoes off and wash my feet or I can wash my hands or I can drink it. I'm like, what do I do? So I chose to wash my hands although it made no sense to me whatsoever. And everybody, they were all looking at me. And when I did, everybody smiled. <laughs> okay, so I was on the verge of breaking a hidden rule because to me it made no sense. If I wanted to wash my hands, I'd go to the bathroom. <laughs> so that's an example of a hidden rule. Um, <clears throat> so there's lots of different groups. I want you to talk at your table a little bit about um, hidden rules that you may be aware of, you know, or ones that you've broken. So talk about that and then we'll share. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> What's an employer going to think? 
that you're getting ready to go to a club. Right. <laughs> but do you believe that individuals absolutely do not know that that's inappropriate? Yes. That that's, yes. Okay. And in Getting Ahead, we actually talk about that in some of the classes. Um, we didn't do it last time, but we have a dress for interview day, and we're all going to, you know, dress up. And then we purposely dress down as facilitators. I don't come in in a suit. I wear jeans and a t-shirt because it's an equal level in Getting Ahead. Okay. What other what other environments? Have rules. We talked about some with school. Okay, um, what are the rules of school? Well, we we kind of looked at both sides. Students have kind of their own unspoken rules as a group. Like you don't ask questions within the last few minutes of class. You don't want everybody. To <laughs> 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 you stand together you don't you know even in your group Solid. I had a class that just did group presentations yes and they have to evaluate their group you know and the amount that said we all contribute equally even though I know somebody in their group it, you knew somebody was dominating meeting, that project and it wasn't there yeah. the day they presented and that like, was a hit everyone rule. contributed perfectly because it's this unspoken rule that you don't rat each other out exactly um, and that's all about relationships <laughs> isn't it? you know but on the flip side we have expectations that if I'm speaking with a student yeah you know they're not going to be like this while I'm talking to them yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and so I think it goes both ways. They have expectations in their own group as students, but then okay. also we kind of have expectations that they walk into. This is this is excellent because part of deal talking about hidden rules, what you want to do is respect the rules that your students are bringing with them, but actually actively teach your hidden rules before they break them. Okay, so we walked into Children's Hospital Rehab, and on the wall there was a sign that said, Please do not use physical discipline on your children here. So they didn't want children slapped, hit, spanked right there, and they put that rule out there so the parents could at least look at it and go, oh, okay, I can't just talk to Johnny, you know, or whatever. So, okay, any other any other groups? Okay. Well, you go. You guys are all um, acting under a hidden rule right this moment. <laughs> Did you know that? We get quiet because you're talking. You get quiet when I'm talking, you're sitting there, you're not on your phone, you're just very, very, very respectful. And I'm acting under a hidden rule, and what am I acting like? Don't answer that. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> Cover the pause. Okay, okay, all right. There's not a response, keep talking. Keep, oh, keep talking, okay, keep talking, fill in the pause, okay, but I'm acting in a certain way that a quote, a presenter ought to act. In one class I actually, um, she doesn't know this, I actually started jumping up and down to demonstrate this. Oh, okay. oh. <laughs> she's like, what will Carolyn do next? Okay, <laughs> okay, any other, any other groups you're thinking of? In school, it's great. School, work, um, what about church? In church, you, you never cuss. Oh, you never cuss at church? church? Even if you do cuss. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're a Christian nonprofit and we have callers calling in and sometimes they will let a word slip and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, I'm sure they know who they're, who they're calling. So that, yeah, so you may modify your normal language, you know, when you're in that environment. Um, so yeah, part of, the, part of the very main thing to remember is don't strip anybody of the rules they came in. You're going to be in a learning curve too. If somebody has a student has different hidden rules, you might be breaking their hidden rules and you don't know it. Mm -hmm. So be aware that you've got to learn where they're coming from. Tell them up front what your expectations are, you know, ahead of time, so they're not just you know in trouble for looking at their cell phone. <laughs> so it helps us to understand the behavior of others better. Okay, so we're going to. Okay, this is your quiz. <laughs> While driving forces. This is sort of a hidden rule. We've articulated, you guys have understood it really well. What is the driving force of middle class? Achievement. Achievement. Or material security is very important. Um, what about poverty? Relationships. Relationships. Survival is also part of the driving force. Um, entertainment plays, plays a part in that as well because I, of the stress. Well, you're, I was going to say, you're so yeah. down that you search for entertainment. And this is hard for us in middle class to understand as we're future planning and you know we're really into budgeting and what have you and somebody's asking for help on a light bill and they have cable and it hasn't dawned on them that they shouldn't have cable because they have to have cable because you know my handicapped son needs to watch this or that or I can't get out of the house and, and so you've got to just be aware you can't just bombard somebody with your values without understanding where they're coming from. Sometimes it's their connection to the world because they, it. they don't oh, yeah. have the finances to Right. You know, so it's the kind of their connection. Or their also, entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so mm -hmm. have you ever, like, come home from a day at work that was just a really super bad day, and it was one of those days that were like, don't anybody talk to me, I can't even think, and you watch a 30-minute sitcom? 
and you just laugh. It gets you out of reality for a minute, and it kind of changes your mood a little bit. And so it's, if you're in constant stress, really kind of helps get you out of reality for a minute. And you're already and then now, and that's course that's course that's 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 that's
A, like you said, I have it. The opportunity is here. I finally yes. have it. Yes. Got my income tax check. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but, um, and that status, I look beautiful so no one will know that I'm really poor. Right. right. And, and you, you know, a lot of people, how much does that cost? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I paid two hundred dollars for that, yeah. but just, you yeah. won't see me ducking behind the corner into the one room apartment. Right, right. With not having food or, or see that. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Okay, good, good, good discussion. So yeah, so in poverty, it maybe now, this week, maybe this month, in middle class, how far out are people planning? To the end of their life. <laughs> to the end of their life. <laughs> 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 All the so way to retirement. Yeah, right? Great financial. <laughs> so it can be, you know, it can be, um, you know, two to four for other things, but retirement or what have you is very, you know, far out in the future. And well, like I said, college savings for children is, you know, 20 years probably. And then in wealth. Um, what time period is wealth trend is looking at or dealing with? Remember, it's past. So it's you're trying to keep what was there going. Yeah. Right? In the past in the decades. 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 Absolutely. Going back a little bit. Sorry. One no, thing that no. amazes me is in class, I'll ask my students when they're going to be finished at Holy City. And 95% of them have no idea when they're going to graduate. Yes. They have no plan of, yes. I want to graduate in spring 2017. I want to graduate in. You know, I don't care if they're on a one class a semester plan and it's yeah. way down the line and they're saying, I want to graduate in 2020. Yeah. I tell them, you know, pick a date and make a plan around that date because right. most of them, they're hearing, yeah, I want to graduate. When I graduate, everything's going to be great and I'll be able to and support my whole family perfect. and yeah. life's going to yeah. be good. But they have no they sense even set a of date. actually, <laughs> when is this going to happen? Yeah. How do I get to that point? And then trying to plan to how many classes per, per semester yeah, do I need to take and, and get there. there. Yeah, and they have no idea. idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is why. This is, they haven't had orientation to this. You know, I mean, from the time, you know, we were little, I think our parents were teaching us about planning and about, you know, saving and all of this. You think about how you talk to your teenager. I mean, I have yeah. a teenager and I have a 72 year old and I have to say to her every day, Every decision you make right now <laughs> affects your future. So I'm constantly talking to her about the future, mm -hmm. about that's, every little thing. And so when you're constantly, way. yeah. So well, it's, it's very interesting. That's a challenge. Is there also a sense? It, it's a sense of time. My husband's always on me about this. He would call me at the office and he would say, "Are you aware of what time it is?" And I said, oh, "It's about six o'clock." He said, "It's nine thirty. Don't you think you ought to come home?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I relate to that. Yes. <laughs> I have no. I have, and I'm wondering if that's what's happening here. They have no sense of. They have no sense of the future or a plan. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. And some of us are sort of timeless individuals. I'm sort of with you. <laughs> I can't plan for time too well. But yeah, so this is really challenging in this environment to try to teach this, to develop planning, and hopefully some of this material will enable you to try to break through this. But you realize what you're dealing with. I mean, this is you know, pretty, Even pretty major. Even time management, we try to teach students that, but that's more future. Time management right. doesn't deal with today. Right. No. 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 <laughs> They'll deal with the future tomorrow. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> but just to plan homework and budgeting time for that and, and those are really valuable skills if you can get you know get that across at all. Okay, so we were we were bringing this up just a minute ago, this feeling of um, fatedness. Um, in poverty, you know, your destiny is what it is. It's just what it is. I have nothing I can do about it. I have the better of two bad choices in life. There's absolutely nothing I can do. I can put out fires or what have you, so you feel like you are quote fated. I can't mitigate cha uh, change or chance. In middle class, we believe we've got power. Our power is in choice. If we make the right decisions now, we can move forward. And even if we make a bad decision, we've got enough resources to cover up for that and to recover from it. But we really feel you know, powerful in choices. And we analyze it. Don't we analyze things all the time about what choices we're going to make? And that we believe we can change our future. Now, poverty, remember, you may feel like, you know, there is no future. There's no future story. There's these young people coming up. Maybe their parents haven't, you know, planted the seed of future planning. And Gina was talking about her daughter. They don't have a future story. They don't, they're here at school, but they don't know exactly how to get to this graduation point or what have you. It's, it's a dream, and they like, you know, like being here, but this is hard, hard to do if you don't believe that you have any power in your choices. Can I just say one quick sure, thing about sure. that? Sure, um, sure. And this gets at affluence versus poverty mindset. Uh, one of the things that I also, also think is true is that we have lots of middle class students here mm -hmm. who don't future plan, and it's because they have been hypermanaged 
by your parents who believe so strongly in choice and power and control. And so they, their lives have been managed by their parents and then they show up here and they don't have those skills because, and it, it's, it's huh. they have the mindset of believing in choice, but they don't, they aren't comfortable making those choices. Do you all think that's point. true? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. I think yes. it's true. Yes. 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 They don't feel that they have to make a choice. Yeah. Because the parents will just make it for them. Yeah. Them. yeah. It's yeah. It's yeah. Or to work out with your parents. Right. Right. It's all good. It's yeah. like, well, somebody's got to tell your children too much and not let them see the effects of choices or choices. Right. You know, because we want them to, you know, be perfect and go forward. And then, well, the police oblige is the idea that uh, they feel fated to. They feel fated that they've been given all of this wealth and they're obliged to give back to the community and to pour that back in. So they're sort of fated on, on both um, ends. So, okay, let's move on. We're gonna talk about power next. Um, okay, so power is very interesting. In middle class, power and respect are separated. Um, middle class responds to position. There's power in information and institutions. Remember when we were talking about the school, you feel like you have power to navigate an institution, a school, um, you know, or, or anything. You feel like you can, you know, make a difference in there. You know, I go to bat in any institution if I'm having a problem, healthcare or what have you. Yeah, let me talk to somebody. <laughs> I'll work it out. So if you think about a job, that's the best example of this one. If your boss is just really uh, treating you really badly to the point of, you know, you're just having a hard time functioning, are you just going to tell them, you know, you can just take this job and walk out the door? Is that probably what you're gonna do in middle class? No. I mean, you can't stand it there anymore. What are you gonna do? I would well, you're either gonna, you're gonna whine to your husband. That's always a good thing to do. <laughs> you may just go find another. Okay, but you're not, you're not going to ruin your reference, right? Because you're future oriented. So you may be looking for another job and you're going to give a two week notice and you're going to thank them for allowing you the opportunity to be employed there and get a good reference for them and move on so you can be successful in your next career. You don't want to close that door, right? Or if it's really horrible, you're going to feel more comfortable making a formal complaint and going through HR or, oh, yeah. or Same something. Thing. You might do that. Like you have the ability to actually say something and speak right. up about it. Whereas if you're in poverty, you wouldn't do that at all because you know the institutions aren't going to listen to me. You're just not going to listen to me. There's nothing I can do for that. Okay, so in, in poverty, power is linked to personal respect. And if you disrespect me on the job, I'm going to let you know that and I'm not going to put up with it for a second. I may walk out. I may say, you can just have this job and walk out the door. So people in poverty potentially might have a lot of job history and moving from one job to the other. To the other, and, and employers at these um, fast food restaurants or what have you feel like the employee is expendable, you can replace them easily, and so they're out the door and gone. So if you see somebody having that problem, um, that could be what. And what then it, is. it looks bad on a future job. You're constantly yeah. changing. Yeah, but I'm not thinking about the future. I'm thinking about right now. I'm mm -hmm. not respected, and that, you know, that my reputation is my respect, and you're going to respect me, and I'm going to let you know if you're not. And it's also with powers related to the ability to fight. Um, this one lady I was telling you about with the, the budgeting problems and what have you, she came from poverty and she said, you know, if something goes down, I can take care of it. Don't worry about it. I'm like, okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 you know, there, there was somebody trying to break in the house and what have you. Don't worry about it. I got it. <laughs> okay, I'll call the police. <laughs> I'm, I have power in that. <laughs> and, you know, the feeling that you can't stop bad things from happening to you. The goodness is this faded kind of, you know, thing that they're just going to happen. That's just the way life is. It's all you've ever known. Is, is stress and, and problems. And then power and wealth is in expertise and your connections and uh, stability. Um, you have the ability to influence policy and direction and programs and you know, feeling pretty, pretty good about yourself. So this is just really important to understand, you know, understand this. So we're gonna talk about a tool um, that can be used and we're gonna be looking at future orientation, which we've been talking about, a great discussion on that, choice and power. So future orientation, tell me how it's going to work out for me because I may not be able to see it. So give me an idea, um, give me information of how a certain situation might play out. If you don't take so many classes, you're not going to graduate till forever. I mean, you've got to sort of, you know, we think that's an assumption that they would know that, right? But they may not. Spell it, you know, spell it out, give that choice. 
choice. I am so busy feeling and dealing with it, I do not see choice. So if there's an intense situation that I'm upset about, I'm dealing with it emotionally. I may not have the emotional um, well, resource yeah. level built up to control my response. So you've got to have some level of mo emotional stability to be able to control a response, a negative response back that might hurt you in the future. So I'm just going to, if something happens, you know, boss says something bad to me, I'm just going to walk out the door and yell at him and I'm going to feel a lot better until I get home and I have no job and no paycheck. So let me know that there are choices, there are different ways to react to a situation, um, challenges, whatever the person is dealing with. Power. So this, we've, we've touched on this, a person may not feel they have any power or say in anything. They may be fighting with social services, trying to get help, health care, they may be involved with the criminal justice system. I do not feel I get treated with res respect and power, so I fight with it. So if you see bad behavior in certain situations, that may be, you know, what you're, what you're dealing with. So all this can, all this faded feeling, feeling of no power, um, can lead to feeling like you're a victim. So I feel like a victim when I don't see it coming. When I don't believe I did anything to cause this bad thing to happen, but what did I do to make my boss mad? Nothing. Took him out at me for no reason. I don't. I don't believe I made any choices that caused my problems. When I'm just thinking that you did it to me, the institution did it to me, or whoever it was. You know, there's no um, ownership of whatever. I am only a victim when I do not have these three concepts. So you can reverse this by giving the concepts of future orientation choice and power. Remove this. Have you seen victim mentality that everything just goes wrong for me and everybody's doing everything to me and it's not my fault? Anybody run across that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. With some, some people. So what you can do is help somebody to, to see what's coming, help them to see what choices are there. You know, if you choose certain um, behavior in the academic setting, you're going to get certain results, right? choose not to do your homework, to prepare, prepare for tests, you're going to fail. So giving them those, those steps ahead of time. I will feel I held power and have some control over my life, that I will be able to make a better informed decision in the moment and next time. So this is a lot of teaching and layering for someone that doesn't have this at all. Is this, is this resonating with you? Think might, might I think I was in a situation once where there was a, we were dealing with high school kids and, and this child was from poverty and, and felt that she was disrespected and wanted to fight back. Yeah. Well, then it was like you're fighting against an authority figure, you know, and that's yeah. being disrespectful. Mm -hmm. So she was left to sit by herself, and one of the instructors spoke with the girl and told her, this is exactly what you need to say and exactly what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny because she listened to the girl's mm -hmm. problem, and she told her, you need to just tell her that you're very sorry and blah, 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 and then you can just go on back to class and it will all blow mm -hmm. over, you know. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just going to get in more trouble if right. you keep fighting. Right. And it's so funny because then they separated and the boss comes back and she's talking to the kid and the kid repeated word for word what she was, what was, was suggested. Yeah. yeah. The boss loved it. Yeah, yeah. It's a perfect answer. Yeah, yeah. Go on back to class, you know. Uh, and I mean, everything was fine, you know. Yeah. It was... But it was almost like you said, give them what they need. Right. Teach they, they them how to do yeah, it. Because <laughs> it may not be something that they know at all. I had to tell them <laughs> word for word. Yeah, and, and I think probably next Friday that you're gonna see a little movie along that line. <laughs> Under, when we get to finishing it. So the tool is um, to, to give them two choices. If you choose, and it's very simple, if you choose, then you've chosen. And you give them one scenario. You know, if you choose to walk out on your job, you have chosen not to have money to pay your KDB or buy food for your children. This tool, when used, you have to use it twice. So you write in two times, twice down there. And you have to give them both scenarios, and it has to be something that's meaningful to them. If you choose not to go yell at your boss and walk out, you will have a, a paycheck coming and you'll have a chance to look for another job. And it could be whatever the scenario is, do the homework or, your, or whatever. So you've got to point, point that out. So you have to use it twice. So um, we've got a little scenario that we're going to pass on. I think we have time to do it here. We can do Charlie here. Uh, or you no. mean or just watch it first? Oh, yeah, yeah, let's watch it. it. Yes, let's watch the movie first. Yeah, yeah we'll do Charlie. I think, I I think we have time. Mm -hmm.
then you've chosen. I said, to show me you're ready for promotion, which ultimately means then you've chosen to get about five steps closer to putting that son of yours into football. Are we good? Good, yeah. Now, in that story, I do need to let you know, I had already disciplined her before this conversation for that event that happened the night before. I was working on the future with her. But see, now she has choice. If you do this, the one sentence in that that you may want to write down is the sentence I like to use a lot is, if you choose, comma, then you've chosen. I use that about a hundred times a day. If you choose, comma, then you've chosen. The reason I enjoy that sentence so much, it gets all three concepts in one sentence. If you choose, you, you're in control here. Choose, that means there's choice. Then you've chosen, builds future orientation. So one sentence can get all three concepts. However, if you use that sentence, I always use it twice. Please note that. I always use that sentence twice. If I just tell that employee, if you choose to use that great creativity and that great initiative to cover the back of just one person, then you've chosen suspension. If I end it there, well, that's great, but I don't show her anything else, right? You always want to use that sentence twice. Use it to show one way, then use it to show another path and end it and allow that person then to make the choice. The next key, when you say, then you've chosen, whatever it is you say after that has to happen. If I say, then you've chosen a suspension, that means the next time this happens, I must suspend her. Or if I say, then you've chosen a, prom a promotion, that means if she demonstrates those characteristics, I have to promote her. So make sure that you hold your expectation and you stay true to it. If you say something and you lower your expectation, what have you taught this person? Well, A, you're not treating them with mutual respect, and you've only reinforced them to manipulate. Right. <coughs> so what did you think about that? Is that something you think you could use? I think with practice. With practice, yeah. <laughs> One thing I like about it, just to dealing with um, the callers and what have you, <clears throat> is that it, it takes the pressure off of me. I realize they're making choices, and they may not be making the choices that I know are going to be beneficial to them, um, but it is not about, you know, just not about me, and I'm freeing them up for that. We were. So what did it, um, how did she, how did she give the future story to this lady? What did she do to, was that lady shocked at what she was saying, do you think? Probably shocked that she remembered about the conversation about her son wanting to play about football. The, about the football? Yeah. yeah. She, I mean, that shows respect right there. Yeah. yeah. She, she had not known person. enough about that employee yeah. and what her, uh, what well, she valued currency in order to have that conversation, to say that part of the conversation. So were the choices that she provided her meaningful to the employee? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. She wasn't just like, you better not be doing this to Catholic Charities, mm -hmm. because that may or may not be meaningful. Her relationships with the other worker was more meaningful than her relationship with her employer, wasn't it? So she's trying to give her another option there, and you know she had already disciplined her and what have you, but this is a totally different way of approaching a problem with somebody or approaching, um, when, when you see that they are making bad choices, you, know, you just wanna say, don't do that, just do this. It's not gonna help. No matter what you, what you think or know, it doesn't really matter, it's gotta be meaningful to them. So when you come up with this, don't say, you know, we had an example of, of a family that was homeless and they were in a motel and um, they needed to go into housing and it was just upsetting to the church person because they were in a motel, right, and they had nowhere to live. Well, it wasn't really upsetting to them, they were sort of comfortable there. So if they chose not to go into housing, they were choosing to run out of money and actually be in the car. But that didn't really bother them. They'd been there before. So you, you know, you've got to say something that's going to be where they're at and what's meaningful to them. But you do have to know them. You do have to know them and be in a relationship to be able to do that and find what's meaningful. You know, a goal or a future thought, you know, something that's emotionally you know, very meaningful to and them. And that can be hard with our students, I think, because there's so many of them. Oh, yeah. How do you get to know, yeah, know them that, you know, that closely? But just 
something, you know, if they have this, you know, this goal or this dream, you know, start with that dream and then sort of plan backwards of how they're getting there. Because if you start with, well, you've got to take this many semesters and this many courses and you've got to make this kind of grade in order to get this, they're going to but you start with the, you know, with the outcome. You are going to get this degree. You're going to have more potential. And let's look, look at how this is going to look for planning for each semester through this course of time. So start with the good stuff and then plan backwards over. I know that sounds bizarre, but, <laughs> and, but we'll be talking about that planning backwards too a little bit later in the, in the series. Um, okay, we've come we have the evaluations and charges. Yes, we're going to give you an evaluation. Um, so please fill that out. And also don't forget to, um, while it's fresh on your mind, Make notes of how you're going to use the material in each of the modules. Mental models, causes of poverty, key points, and hidden rules. How you think you might use it in your work. And this is for you to keep, but we just wanted you to be able to jot down applications that you see you can use so you can remember that. And then we're passing out a scenario. Uh, it's just a very simple scenario, but it's a little bit of practice for, um, for using this. And it's called Charlie's Request for Help with Gas. And he's calling into the clearinghouse asking for gas vouchers from churches continually. And you can read the scenario. Um, he was in a, cover, a recovering addict. He's on disability. He found a church home that was supporting him in his sobriety, but he didn't have money to put in his uh, car for gas. And so he just wanted churches to keep supporting him for gas. And you know, I sort of shared with him that that was not really what that money was there. So what you've got to figure out is what other choices you could explain to him that might be options for him that he could choose. He has um, a, a, a visibility of 674, and he is um, he has an inexpensive rent because he's in housing, but he is paying $60 a month for cable. So what I want you to do is just at, at home, and we'll go over this when we start back next time, what choices could he make? And use the if you choose, you've chosen. Identify some choices and then, and then see how you could present it to Charlie based on something that's meaningful to him in this whole story. That makes sense. Okay, so we'll give you a few minutes to fill out your evaluations, and um, we'll see you next Friday to finish up. Do you have any reading that that we need to be looking at, or do you suggest that we just look up, look through the book, the framework book? Yeah, I would look through it. The, the pages are all off on this, mm -hmm. but if you can find the middle models and the causes mm -hmm. yes. that would that are not, but this is from the other book, mm -hmm. so you might want to go ahead. Read through the modules that we've done. Yeah. Okay. I wonder. Yeah, might be, we might be able to quickly see, you know, where it's at in that one. In that book. And if you have any questions on anything today, just feel free to, to ask us.